When you talk with people, the average person is not all that happy. I was about 19 and a half years old, had been a Christian a little over a year, and I had always lived by the premise that if you were successful, then you would automatically be happy. And so at the ripe age of about 13, I decided that sports and academics and dating the right girl and going on to school and a number of things were my measures of success, and I became probably a very goal-oriented, workaholic, underachiever, overachiever, whatever, who went like a madman in order to achieve those goals. And I remember waking up, graduating as a senior in high school, and saying, well, I've accomplished my goals. And then having the most devastating experience I've ever had, feeling absolutely empty, having had good grades and a nice-looking girlfriend and a scholarship to play basketball in college, all my dreams. You know, it's like the little golden pot at the end of the rainbow. We all have little golden pots, but we put different names on them. For some, it's success. Others, it's fame. Some, it's popularity. Others, it's business. Others, it's this relationship or that. And we have these little dreams, and we chase the rainbows. And we think at the end of that rainbow, building my own business, having a boyfriend, having a girlfriend, having children, being a mother, being a father, you name it. And we run after them, but often, once we get them and we look inside the little golden pot, what happens? It's empty. I remember a guy sharing his golden pot illustration, and he said, you know, fame, one of the most famous people back then was Muhammad Ali, the most famous athlete. And then he told the story of how Muhammad Ali in a little coffee shop pulled off the gold medal that he'd won in the Olympics and drove his car to a little bridge, slammed on the brakes, got out, and threw the gold medal in the water because he was just denied a cup of coffee in a restaurant in America because he was black. All of his fame, all of his success seemed meaningless. And then he talked about, you know, physical attraction. And some of you will remember Marilyn Monroe and how she was the sex goddess of the day. And he told the story of how she had all this outward beauty, but she had a hollow emptiness in her life. And so she committed suicide, an overdose of pills. And one by one, he took fame and success and wealth, and he told the story of John Paul Getty, who was the richest man in the world at that time. And they asked him, what's it take to really make you happy? He said, one more dollar or one more million. And he said, but I'd trade it all for one good marriage. And and what he did is he just, he painted a picture in my mind that helped me see that, you know, we all have these little rainbows, but the real issue is, will the pot that we're chasing, once we finally get there, if we do get there, Will it satisfy? Will it make us happy? And his point was, most of us spend a lifetime chasing things that will never make us happy. I think it's important because the Apostle Peter is going to help us learn how to live happy lives. But I think before we do that, I want to define happiness. And by the way, this has been hard. I mean, I've really thought about happiness. What, what's really involved? I mean, more than the trite, well, I feel good inside. I mean, that doesn't quite cut it. Let me give you, as I've thought this through, three elements essential for you to be happy. And this passage will explain how to have these. Essential element number one in defining happiness is personal peace. A person will never be happy until they're content or at peace with God and with themselves. You know and I know people that own lots of things, that have great jobs, that are good looking, that have all the things that, quote, make us happy, but they don't have personal peace. And so they're not happy. And I'd like you to view these as like a number one, a number two, and then a number three in concentric circles, like a target. The center one and the others are built on it, is personal peace or contentment. Number two, I think, is enriching relationships where a mutual love is exchanged. It's that idea of community. Remember throwing the word around koinonia? means community or fellowship in Greek. The idea of a sharing deeply from the heart of having relationships where you're close to people, where you're open, where there's love that flows both ways. I mean, all of us know that when you move, what do you you miss? 
It's the relationships, isn't it? So happiness begins with contentment. Second, there has to be community or these enriching relationships. And third, I find people that have both of those but still aren't happy. Because everyone needs a reason to get up in the morning. Something to give your life for. I believe we are designed to feel significant. Like, I want to look back on my life and say, you know what? Chip Ingram's life mattered. And I believe every person in this room has the same sense. And that's this idea of not only contentment and community, but the third thing everyone needs is a cause. You need a cause to give your life to. You need to know that your life counts, a sense of significance, a reason to get up, not just to fulfill your own pleasure and not just to be with friends that you like. Those are great. But if there isn't something beyond that, happiness is like that elusive butterfly. And so I'd like to define happiness as not even an end in itself, but the byproduct of a relationship with God that brings about contentment or personal peace, the byproduct of mutual enriching relationships with people where love is exchanged, and the byproduct of working and sacrificing for a cause that is bigger than yourself where you know your life has meaning forever. I mean, isn't, doesn't it strike you unusual that we inscribe our names in marble? Isn't it interesting that when people set up trust funds, that they put their name in the trust fund so that we all know of Carnegie Mellon that when they do the Peace Prize, it's the Nobel Peace Prize. You know how that came about, don't you? He's the one who discovered dynamite. And he was in Europe at the time. And his brother died, and in Europe he read the paper, but they mistakenly put his name in it, and his obituary read, blank Nobel, discovered dynamite, the destructive force upon the earth. And he read it, and what he saw was, this is what people think my life counted for. And he decided to take his huge fortune and become a philanthropist and begin to give money away and bring about peace in the world after reading his own obituary. Well, the question is, how in a very imperfect world, how do you get this joy? How? That's what Peter is going to give us. Open up to 1 Peter, if you will. And we're in chapter 2, chapter 3, excuse me, verses 8 through 12. If we were going to diagram this passage, here's how I would have you diagram it. There's seven commands in verses 8 and part of 9, seven commands about how to be happy in relationships with people. Two categories, family, people, and foes. And then right in the center, we're going to read the very axiom of how to be happy. He's going to say this. Be a blesser in order to inherit a blessing. He's going to tell you and I the way to find real happiness is to give it away. You will inherit or receive a blessing, joy, fulfillment, meaning, significance, when you are the instrument that God uses to bring joy, fulfillment, and meaning to the lives of others. And he'll tell us in those seven commands how to do it with people that know God and are a part of the family. And then he'll give us two commands about how to do it with people that don't like you at all. And then in verses 10 through 12, because he's going to assume that we, like the original readers, are going to say, wait a second. You just told us that we're being slandered, right? You just told us that we're slaves, that we're being treated unjustly, right? And you're telling us a lot of us are in marriages that aren't very good. And you're going to now say that we can be happy? And so he's going to quote Psalm 34, and he's going to raise this issue. He says, for if you want to, literally the word is, if you want to wish for love of life, if you want to experience life in its fullness and see good days, basically, if you want to be happy, he says, you need to follow three, these three conditions. So the top part will be the commands of how to do it. The bottom part will be conditions that have to be met for you to experience it. So let's read it. Let me give you the overview. Open up and follow along. The context we remember is how believers can have a positive reputation in the midst of adversity. See if you don't see. Verse 8, finally... And it, this word is to summarize, to bring all this to a head, all of you, 
Here's five quick commands for how to live in Christian relationships. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. We'll look at them in a minute. Verse 9, this is how to relate with people who don't like you. Do not repay or exchange evil for evil or insult for insult. In other words, when people give you a hard time, don't retaliate. But with a blessing. So we're to bless those who curse us if we want to be happy. Now notice here's the reason. Because to this, to what? This idea of being a blesser to this, you were called. God, when he brought you to personal relationship with himself through Christ, called you, and part of being a Christian is being called to bless those who curse you and to bless those in the family. Now, that's the reason, but now look at the purpose. The purpose is so that you may inherit a blessing. That means so you can be, the word blessing means happy. You can inherit, you can be happy. So verses 8 and 9 explain how to be happy in relationships. And now look at verse 10. It starts off with the reason or some justification, some validation for this rather wild premise. For whoever would love life or wish to love life, literally, you really want to love life? You want to get up and say, man, it's great to be alive. Now, This is in the context of, it's great to be alive, even though people slander me. It's great to be alive, even though I get some unjust treatment as a slave. It's great to be alive, even though my marriage isn't what I'd like it to be. If you would wish to love life, and if you'd like to see in the future good days, I mean, isn't that happiness when you like more good days than bad days? I would. Then he gives three conditions. Conditions number one, he says, you must keep your tongue from evil and your lips from practicing deceit. Condition number two, he must turn from evil and do good. Condition number three, he must seek peace and pursue it. Talking of reconciliation and relationships there. And then verse 12 is the reason. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And it means in a special way. I mean, his eyes are on everyone. But the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Now listen to this. And his ears are attentive to their prayer. See, the source of happiness ultimately comes from God. And he knows your desires. And as you ask him, when these conditions are met, he answers. But look at the flip side of it. End of verse 12. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, let's break this apart together and see if we can't come up with some very simple principles about how to be happy, and then we'll come back and look at a couple empty buckets and also uh, see how you're doing in your quest. Let's first look at how to be a blesser in God's family. That's verse 8. And remember the axiom. You want to be happy? You want to be blessed? Blessed. Remember what Jesus said? It is more blessed to give than to receive. You know why, by the way, people uh, have a little bounce in their step around Christmas time? You know why that there's just a chance, even in the midst of bumping into people, that in the stores, oh, excuse me, oh, oh no, you go ahead, go ahead. Now, get down to the 23rd and the 24th, this goes out the window. <laughs> get out of my way, you jerk! I had that sweater first, you know, you know. But you know what happens in the Christmas spirit? Imagine this. There are actually people walking around the mall like this, thinking. Here's what's going through their mind, thinking. What could I get so-and-so? What could I get Judy? What could I get Mark? What could I get Bob? What could I get my son? What could I get my mom? They're actually walking through stores thinking about other people and what they could buy to what? Make other people happy. You realize this is a rare phenomenon in American culture. You see... The other 11 months out of the year, they walk around the mall saying, you know what, my MasterCard isn't completely full and I love that dress and oh, those boots would look good and I want the scarf and that's a great suit and so what if I have four and you know, and so we're looking for ourselves. And there's something amazing about putting the needs of other people ahead of ourselves that brings this Christmas spirit. And this passage basically will teach that if you can learn 
in dependence upon the grace of God to be a blesser and live in a day-by-day way where you are blessing and loving and giving to other people, you will almost magically find you will be a happy person. But if we are, by our old nature, selfish and sinful and asking what can I get out of this relationship and what can I get from this company and what can I get from this person and that person and we place demands on others, then what happens is we tend to be very frustrated because people never live up to our expectations. How to be happy. Let's look at how we do it first in God's family. There's five commands. And by the way, a lot of this is review. So if I go over some of it a little bit quickly, just go back and look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2. We covered a lot of it. Or when we look at repaying evil for evil, we looked at that pretty carefully when we looked at the slave-master relationship. So starting with, let's look at the structure of verse 8. And to explain the structure, for those of you that you know like technical things, this is called a chiastic structure. For all the rest of us, who cares? To, to explain it, let me put it this way, though. And as you walk in our family room, which is a real blessing, we've never had a family room before. It's got a fireplace. It's really neat. And uh, it has one of those mantles that go all the way across in brick. And most people, when you... Where's the focal point of the room? The focal point is the middle. And so often what you do is you put maybe a candle on this end and a candle on this end, right? Kind of nice symmetry. And then you move in about a foot and a half or two, and you might put three books with some bookends on each side and three books over here. And then in the middle, you either put a real classy picture or an antique clock or a picture of your wife or husband or a family portrait. And what are you saying is, what you want the attention to be drawn to is, well, this is nice, there's light and there's knowledge, but the real focal point is the middle. And in Hebrew thinking, often in the Psalms and often like in 1 Peter it happens, in this verse he's doing that. So what he's going to do is he's going to say, there's a way to think about one another. Here's the candles on the end. The very first word and the last word will talk about reshaping our thinking to become a blesser or a giver. And then he'll say, you know, it's not enough just to change our thinking, but then he'll move in and the second word and the fourth word, he's going to say, we need to change the way how we feel. And the real feeling words like compassion and sympathy. But the focal point of the entire command is action. And he's going to say, we should not, literally, it's not love as brothers, but be devoted in brotherly love, that Philadelphia word, loyalty, sacrifice. So see if you can see it with me. Look at what he says. Verse 8, finally, all of you, on this end, live in harmony. And the word means to be like-minded. For unity's sake, live in harmony. Be of the same mind. And then notice the other thinking word. In fact, it has the same root. The fifth part there, it says, be humble-minded or be humble That's the same word used in Philippians 2 when it says, consider the interest of others as more important than yourself. And so he's saying the very first step to becoming a blesser is we have to get our focus in our thinking off of ourselves and onto others. That's all he's saying. Be like-minded and put the needs of it. Be humble. And humble doesn't mean you're, you're less important or you're bad. It just means that humility, you're not thinking of yourself at all. What do other people need in the family? That's the idea. But thinking differently won't change you, will it? So he goes to the next level about feeling. Be sympathetic is the second word. And then the bookend there is to be compassionate. Sympathetic literally means to enter into the feelings of another, to feel like they feel, to feel their joy like they feel it, and to feel their sorrow like they feel it. And then compassion is a little bit stronger. It's from the root word that comes from our word for, in the Old Testament word, a woman's womb. It has the idea of a very deep feeling that's so deep in you that you hurt for a person, pity or compassion, to the point that you feel it and must act. Every time it's used of Jesus, he acts to meet the need in the life of another person in the New Testament. So we change our thinking, and then we become compassionate, sympathetic, tender-hearted feeling like other people. You you realize this is a little bit rare even among Christians. You realize that often what we're asking is, what can you do for me? Even in our marriages, don't, you know, meet my need. Don't you realize I'm lonely? 
Don't you know I need to talk? Don't you know I need to rest? Don't you know? And he's saying this will transform how we begin to interact with one another. You know, we need to share. That's what makes us happy, isn't it? Have you ever had something either super great or super terrible happen and not be able to share it with anyone? You talk about the pits. The, the most emotional moment I can think of in my life, and I'm not sure why, I, I don't know why, but uh, the first time Teresa and I went through a birth together, and the whole thing happened, and I had all the, you know, the green stuff and the mask, and I was in this little room, and I pulled the thing, and I just held my son, and, and it was so overwhelming. I remember getting on my knees on that linoleum floor and just crying and thanking God, thinking, this is incredible. And then I looked around, and there wasn't anybody. I mean, I, I mean, there was nobody. I mean, Teresa, she was out, you know, and, you know, I couldn't go <laughs> hug her. And it was like, it was like, this is my mountaintop experience, and I'm here all alone. And it's such a sense of, gosh, <laughs> it's a Texas expression, I'm sure. But I pulled that little curtain, and lo and behold, walking right down was the elder of my church. It was a large church, so I didn't even know him that well. But once a month, he called just to ask me what he could pray for. And there he was. And, you know, it was, it was one of those times where I wasn't real close to the guy, you know, like we talked and did stuff together. But he sensed what was going on. He just came give me the biggest bear hug. And man, I just hugged this guy. He said, come on, tell me all about it. And we went to the greasiest little spoon, greasy place right across from the hospital for two hours, eggs and greasy hash browns. And I bet I talked straight for two hours. And he just listened. He loved me. It made me happy. And I've had some pretty low times where I've had deep, deep friends who would listen. See, isn't that what we're, happiness is all about in relationships? Thinking of others, entering in and sharing, but it's not enough just to feel for them. The, the middle word there is love as brothers, or it's that word out of Romans 12, be devoted to one another in loyalty and sacrifice. To me, this word is do what it takes for the family. You know what, my, if my sister flew in from Kentucky and said, hey, Chip, I'm really sorry, but there was a nursing convention and it's 2.30 in the morning, but I really wanted to talk to you. I hope you're not mad. Mad? How long are you going to be here? Six hours. Okay, I'll pick you up for breakfast. I mean, I don't really like to get up at 2.30 in the morning and drive to San Francisco, but she's my sister. I love her. I'd do it in a New York minute, and so would you. Or you get a call early in the morning and someone says, boy, my wife and I are going through it. We really... I don't know what's wrong. I just feel like I'm just butting my head against the wall, and I know you're busy, but is there any way we could get up early maybe tomorrow and have breakfast and talk? And you look at your calendar, and there's no way in the world. And you say, you bet. Because they're family. That's what he's saying. Do you want to be happy? You really want to be happy? If you want to be happy in God's family, think of others, feel deeply, and then act. Love them. Be a blesser. Do whatever would build the life of another person in your thinking, in your feeling, in your actions. And Peter is saying, even if you're being slandered, even if you're getting unjust treatment as a slave, even if you're in a marriage that isn't all that good, because that's the context of this passage. He said, if you will think of others, feel deeply for others, and act to meet their needs, there is a byproduct called happiness that will overwhelm your life. I hate to admit it, but often... During those kind of times, I wander around waiting for someone to come be my friend. And I wander around saying, how come nobody notices? And sometimes I pout. Sometimes I act real quiet. Sometimes I've even learned to walk to let people know that something's wrong. <laughs> you know? And I want them to say, oh, chip, 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 what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? Well, I'm, you know. And, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes what we do is what we want to do we really don't want help. I, I, I came upon a little principle that, I, let me just confess to you, I haven't practiced it in a while, but when I used to practice it real often, it was really neat. I read it someplace, and I decided to do a secret kind act every day. And sometimes I would phone someone out of the blue. Sometimes I'd write a letter. Sometimes I'd send someone flowers. Sometimes people I worked with, I'd just go get them a cup of coffee. And it, was, it wasn't big stuff. But it was just a rule that every day I was going to do an act of kindness. And if at all, if I could do it secretly, it was even better. And you know something? It was amazing. No matter where I was at emotionally, 
when I turn the knob and got my focus on other people, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, the next area is, well, yeah, okay, I, I can buy that. You know, I can, I can buy being friendly and loving and sympathetic and compassionate with believers. But what about my boss? What about my neighbor who really gives me a hard time? What about some of my in-laws? What about people that I don't get along with, even in the body? He says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Don't retaliate. I'd like to suggest that very carefully jot this down, Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21, and that's an extended treatment of that passage. He says, bless those who curse you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. He says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap burning coals upon his head. Don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And the idea of burning coals on their head in the context there is not that, you know, you're going to singe their brain. <laughs> the idea was that when people treat you badly, if you will bless them, if you'll go the second mile, if you'll, Matthew 5, love your enemies, it will overwhelm them and they'll repent. And that's a picture of a man walking through the village with coals on his head, I'm sure with a towel underneath of it, saying, I was wrong. I was wrong and I repent. And the way to overcome those who are giving you a hard time is to give them what they don't deserve. Now, use this in a wise, good context. That doesn't mean if someone is absolutely tearing up your life or you're getting completely unjust treatment that you don't go through the normal channels. This is in personal retaliation. It means don't get bitter. Don't get angry. Don't try and get back. Bless them who curse you. Look what our Lord did. He blessed those who cursed. And let me, let me ask you a question, just practical. When people are giving you a hard time, even if it's in your family, or at work. When you get mad and upset and bitter and angry and resentful, who gets the ulcers? You or them? Who can't sleep at night? You or them? Well, I mean, does it really accomplish anything? You know what will really accomplish you something? Entrust them to God, give them back to God and say, Lord, hey, they're yours. And willfully choose by the grace of God to bless those who do you wrong. And you'll be happy. There are people, there's people in this room, I would imagine, that you have let an unkind boss or a difficult in-law situation or a very hard blended family situation or some person that just gives you a raw, you've given them the power to ruin many of your days of your life because you're angry at them. And you know something? Don't give people that kind of power. God's gonna, God's gonna work out all the scales in the end. You just trust God and you bless them. And you know what? It will change them. It may take time. I shared of a guy that it took over two years, and God brought about real change. My good buddy, Jerry. If those of you who were there will remember. Boy, I'll tell you what. That was uh, an interesting situation. Well, now those are how to be happy in Christian relationships. That's how to be happy in relationships with those who are your enemies. And he says the reason that we've already covered is you bless them because you're called to it so that you inherit a blessing. And then the question, whoever would love lives, you want to be happy and see good days. Now he's going to give us three conditions. Condition number one is to keep your tongue from evil and lips from deceitful speech. And I would suggest that you write down purity is a prerequisite for happiness. I don't think it's accidental that he started with our speech. What does the speech always tell about a person? According to Jesus, Luke 6, 45, what comes out of your mouth reveals what's in your heart. According to James, if you ever get control of your tongue, you'll have control of your whole body. Remember the context? They're being slandered. When you get slandered, what do you want to do? Slander back. And he's saying, step number one, Purity of heart. See, without purity of heart, even if you're a believer, there can't be any peace. 
You know, if you're nickel and diamond getting back at people over here, if there's resentment, if you're speaking evil, the word blessing, we get our word eulogy, to speak well of another. If you're trying to get back, if there's vengeance and anger and resentment, you won't be happy. That's what he's telling you. So condition number one is look at your speech. Look at the times when you're tempted to get back or to pass on a rumor or to report someone in just enough light that people begin to question their character. I mean, we've got a lot of slick ways to do it. We do it in the body. We do it outside the body. But he's saying, if you get involved in that, you'll never be happy. Purity is a prerequisite. It's an absolute prerequisite for happiness. Condition number two is he must turn from evil and do good. This is a command. It's in a tense in the original language that has the idea of stop doing evil and start doing good. Repentance is a prerequisite for happiness. Your heart needs to be pure before God and repentance, this doing evil. Who do we do evil to? Other people, don't we? When we lie, when we cheat, when we're involved in immorality, basically aren't we saying take, 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 And if you have to pay or if it costs you, so what? Isn't stealing just a shortcut form of you work and I take the stuff off the top? Isn't lying just a shortcut for unwilling to deal with the truth in order so that I can get without having to give? And so he's saying repentance. We need, if there is something in our life, not only pure speech, but if there's impure actions, If we're doing something that we know is wrong, happiness is not going to come until you deal with that. Stop doing evil. Start. Notice it's not just stop doing evil, but it's start or do good. Do you get his theme again? Be a blesser. Be a blesser. Be a giver. Quit being a taker. Be a blesser. Third condition is not only pure speech and pure actions, but pure relationships. He must seek peace and pursue it. And I think the idea has the idea of reconciliation, a pursuer of peace. And so reconciliation is also a prerequisite for happiness. I saw a a young fellow that I've gotten to know just a little bit, don't know him real well, and we were just talking and Another friend came up and I said, hey, I don't know you all. Nice to meet you and shook hands. He said, yeah, this is my brother. He said, "Uh, this is a real special day for us. I said, really? Why? He said, well, not just that he's in church with me, but we haven't spoken in two years. And, And, you know, you should see the look on those guys' face. And then they looked at each other. Reconciliation. Seek peace and the word pursue, zealously run after. Anytime there's a, a gap between you and another person, as, that doesn't mean you can solve it, but as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You need to know you've done everything possible. They can still thumb their nose at you, but you've asked God forgiveness for your part in it. You've asked the other person for their part. You've taken every step to bring the relationship back. And think, too, you talk about happiness. When you are a mediator or a reconciler of here's a man or a woman or a neighbor or a friend or employee who doesn't know Christ, and they're not happy. They're chasing all kind of empty buckets like us Christians do way too often. And when God would use you to reconcile this person with the holy God, and if you've ever had the privilege in your life of bowing your head with another person and hearing them confess that their life isn't working out well, that they are selfish, that they have sinned, and they're very sorry and asking, God, will you come into my life and forgive me? And I believe Jesus paid for it and that I can be in your family. If you have ever had that privilege, you talk about joy. See, reconciliation always brings joy. Purity brings joy because purity brings peace. Doing good instead of doing evil, instead of guilt. See, look, what are the things that keep you from being happy? If you trace this through... Does guilt keep you from being happy? Yes. The answer, purity. What's the second thing that keeps you from being happy? Bondage. You know, when when you're enslaved to sin, it's your master. You can't be free. And so he says, turn from it. The third thing is conflict. When you have conflict with other people, are you happy? I'm not. 
If you're in bondage to something, are you happy? No. When you feel guilty, are you happy? He's just saying these are conditions. You really want to be happy. A, be a blesser to inherit a blessing. And B, purity with God, purity with people. And be a reconciler. Pull things back together. And these conditions, if they're met, the interesting thing is you could draw an arrow from these conditions back up to the original commands, couldn't you? Don't these conditions sound like people who are living like-minded and in humility? Like people who are sympathetic and out of compassion, loving one another? Isn't, isn't relationships where happiness isn't? I mean, you could put me on a desert island. You give me a half a dozen people and my wife and my family, I'll tell you, I'm happy. Now, we'd work on running water, electricity, and getting a basketball court up and some other things. Uh, but you know something? People, basically, we have bought into the empty bucket theory, even as believers, thinking that chasing fame, fortune, wealth. Now, by the way, there's, if God gives you fame, fortune, wealth, great. Just be a good steward of it. This is not an either or against. But some of us, in the name of God, let's be honest, the heart being deceitful, we say, oh, yeah, God, oh, yeah, God. But where we're really looking for happiness is in success, popularity, fame. Ministry, even. When the guy shared that illustration, you know what he told me? He said, he drew all these empty buckets on this napkin. He said, there's two buckets. If you invest in them, every time when you follow the rainbow and look inside, they'll always be full. He said, one is people. He was talking about being a blesser. You invest your life in people. You love people. You help kids. You help employees. You help neighbors. You build people up. You love people. And you know what? It's like putting money in a bank. The interest just grows and grows and grows. And you know, you talk about happiness. We had a couple come that I just couldn't even believe it's been 10 years that we did their premarital counseling. I don't understand how it works, but I got to have, and Teresa got to have, a little part of investing in people. And now they're leading people to Christ and their, their marriage after, you know, some struggles like I've had and most of you've had and others that haven't. Two compliant people got married and we don't understand you all. But, uh, you know, isn't it exciting that any time you invest in people, the returns are great? And the other is the Word of God. Every moment, every second you meditate, get your heart and your mind in the Word of God in such a way that it begins to saturate and change how you think and feel. It makes you a blesser. You never, you always get a good return on those two things. Well, we said there's three elements, and I'd just like to close with three questions for you, okay? Number one, are you happy? Are you really happy? Are you looking for happiness? Are you looking for it in the right places? This passage has told us how to get it. It begins with contentment. Do you have peace with God? I don't care what you own, what you drive, or what you don't own, or what you don't drive. Until you get peace with God, if you're here today and you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you for your sin and exercise biblical faith, can I tell you, you will never be happy. You'll get a few highs and then the drop. Another few highs and then the drop. You will find empty bucket after empty bucket after empty bucket. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And I urge you, if you ever want to be happy, and God is speaking to your life, and if he's here, the scripture always speaks, I encourage you, don't walk out of any of these doors until you've made peace with God. Some of you have made the initial peace with God. You're justified, but there are areas in your life you do not have peace because of some impurity. You can't do evil. You can't live in sin. You can't have anger, bitterness. You can't be involved in immorality. You just simply can't do those things without the price tag of depression and guilt and anger and all that baggage. For your benefit, God is saying, peace with God means repentance. Stop doing evil. Ask God to forgive you today and create in you a new heart and start doing good. Contentment is the first concentric circle. Second concentric circle, 
Remember it? Community. Do you have friendships that are deep? Are you having some highs and maybe some of you having some lows, but when you pull the curtain of your life, there's no one there to give you a bear hug? Then take verse 8 and become a blesser. Don't play the Chip Ingram game of walking around the church waiting for someone to pick you up and ask you what's wrong. You realize that if you feel that way, there are probably 1,499 who feel the same way on any given day. And if you will become a blesser and begin to meet the needs in compassion, sympathy, love, and humility and reaching out to others, something's going to happen. i got to warn you. You will discover community. And number three... If you really want to be happy and you say, hey, as far as I know, I'm walking with God, I'm content. I've got some good brothers and sisters, but there's just something missing. Then I would say you haven't taken up the cause. The first one starts with faith, the second with love, and this last one is what provides hope. And without all three, you're never happy. The cause. The cause is to reach the world. The cause is, why do I get up in the morning? Why do you get up in the morning? Because there's people whose eternity will rest on what we do. I mean, God is sovereign, and we're not going to get in his way, but you can be a part of the process or not. Are you on the team? Have you found a niche where God's using your gifts? Get off the sidelines. Get out of the stands. Do whatever you need to do where you're at and become a player. Because unless there's a reason to get up more than to you be fulfilled and you find a group of people that you can feel chummy with, I will guarantee you'll never be happy. You were created so that you can look back and say, there's my mark. And it wasn't just my name at the top of a company. And it wasn't just that I raised a couple kids. But my mark, in the midst of all that, I was used by God. And that goes into the annals of eternity. And you will feel significant. You will feel loved and accepted. And that's people how to be happy. That's rediscovering this lost art of being happy. Contentment, community, and a cause. Where does it begin? With Christ.